Welcome to the demolition episode of the International Society of Explosive Engineers web series Explosives Every Day, where we look at how explosives are used in a variety of applications. My name is Alistair Torrance, and I'm the president of the ISEE. Our organisation started in 1974 when a group of like-minded people got together in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to discuss how to better apply commercial explosives and how to champion the blaster in the field. Move forward to today and we are an international organisation with more than 4,000 members spread over 90 countries with a mission to advance the science and art of explosive engineering worldwide. We do this through sharing our knowledge and providing training and education for everyone involved with blasting. We also have a strong education foundation and have awarded more than $1 million in scholarships to our students in our industry. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our series partners, Dyna Nobel, Opit Blast and LDE Global. This series would not have been possible without their tremendous support. This episode highlights how explosives are used for the demolition of structures. This episode sponsors a SIGICOM and Accurate Energetic Systems. And here's a little bit about them. SIGICOM is a Swedish multinational company that develops, manufactures, rents, and markets products used to monitor environmental parameters such as vibration, noise and air pressure, mainly to the professional end users. Several mega projects, as well as everyday users around the world, choose SIGICOM's InfraSystem to ensure that the environmental parameters of their projects are controlled, stored, and presented in the best possible way. For over 40 years, AES has supplied their customers in both commercial and defense markets with products that perform reliably in the most austere conditions. They supply copper-clad linear-shaped charges for building demolition, cast boosters for blasting operations, specialty formulated explosive compositions for oil well perforating charges, custom breaching charges, and explosive components used in munitions applications around the world. Our presenters are Jim Reedike, President of Dicon Explosive Demolition, Ron Gilbert, Vice President of Dicon Explosive Demolition, and Roberto Fulci, owner of Nitrex. Jim Reedike is the President and owner of Dicon Explosive Demolition, and he has over 40 years of experience in the industry. Dicon services include implosions, demolition of chimneys, bridges, piers, industrial structures, reinforced concrete, and also vessel cleaning. Ron Gilbert has also been in the industry for nearly 40 years and is currently Vice President of Dicon Explosives Demolition. He's had experience as a lead blaster, explosives manufacturing, sales and training, and also in explosives demolition. So Ron and Jim are going to share their experiences of building demolition contractors over their more than 70 years of combined experience. We're going to watch them take down three 775 foot tool stacks and a large steel industrial structure and give us some insights as it goes ahead. So Roberto Fulci is an Italian contractor who has been applying explosive engineering to building and bridge demolition open pit and underground excavations, tunnelling and underwater demolition. He was educated as a mining engineer and also had time in the Italian military. In his working life he's been a consultant, a contractor and also worked for an explosive manufacturer. In his work he's pioneered the use of shaped charges for underwater excavations. During this presentation we're going to see some of the bridge and water tower demolition that he's been involved with. It's going to be a question and answer session with the presenters right after this presentation. The panel will discuss many questions that were asked by a live audience at the time of this episode's first airing. So now it's time to learn how a small amount of explosive applied in just the right manner can bring down very large industrial st structures as we look at how explosives are used in the demolition industry.
Jim Reedyke, uh, president of Daikon Explosive Demolition. Primarily, Daikon acts as a subcontractor to a prime demolition contractor, so it's a team effort for our power. We say to them, we'd like you to prepare the building in this way, gut the building out, clean it out, do this, take this section of the building down conventionally, then we call it open it up, clean all the stuff out of the building and leave it just on its bare columns so we can see nothing but columns, whether it's concrete or steel. Can continue to develop a plan of how we're going to torch you, if it's steel or drill holes or so forth. We uh, add our expertise, add the explosives, provide insurance, and uh, uh, push the button and go home. Right, tell me why you're spraying the box here. So brother Jim knows we did. We check it because we checked it. And you can stand down there and they say, oh look, they must have checked it. Right. Now, do you think we need to speed the time up through here? If that's the case, we're only two, we're only 200 milliseconds between between those delays. I don't think those columns so, because I think the preset boxes will keep everything moving. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Evenly now. Plus, you got this whole this front wall is heavily trussed. Yeah. Correct. It's, it's they're not going to just they're not going to shear. You're not going to get column here. They're, they're going to be trying to be pulling this. Right. Thing. Okay. All right. time now. Awesome. And then there's previously cured foam tied. You tying your notch and taping them up good? Yes sir. Awesome. Tying up those tails. Then you'll tie then you'll foam yours after you tied it up. Yep, it's all good. All good, right here in the hinge. Now we worried about that reduced burden causing any fly. Uh, I light loaded them for that reason. That's a darn good answer. <laughs> Wanna make sure we kick it. One chance. One shot, one kill, right? That's right. Infantry. Infantry. <laughs> Uh, these holes are drilled on 18 inch centers. Um, the holes are about 15 inch in depth, loaded with uh, nitroglycerin or stick dynamite, um, primed with deck cord, 25 grain deck cord, all tied in together at once. So this will this will all shoot at uh, one time to knock out this wedge uh, to make the center of gravity fall this direction and uh, knock the stack over. Not on mad. We are in uh, the number two tower. Daikon has all the holes tied in with deck cord. Take a piece of tape. See right here, for instance, we've got wire and cord. You see how loosey goosey that deck cord is? I, yeah. I don't like that. I don't like that. And I don't like it right here. We have room to tape here, and we got a place here to tie four it up. Four inches, to just take the whole works and tie it up? Yes, and the four inches will affect it. You don't want that loosey, you don't want that loosey slop in here because when the deck cord fires, it acts like a whip. And the whipping action of the deck cord, when it's loose like that, can actually break itself. And we don't want that. That 
big shear is going to lift that piece of flat metal, put it up and prop it against the stack, the door hole, on this end with the exposed deck. When the first stack falls and is tipping over, if for some reason there's a delay and that stack continues and hits the ground, the open end of the stack as it hits is like a bag of potato chips. All that air collapses, the air blows out the back of the stack. So if this air is forced back, then stack number two, that door opening is going to get smashed with the air pressure and debris and it can cut our deck cord off and it's just a chance we're not going to take. So we have the time and the resources, we'll put that steel plate up there just like this box to protect any of that flying frag from hitting the next target. These bar on the back, I've marked them, they get torch cut the morning of the shot. Technically that's the only thing holding this stack up. Because the rest have been cut. So we cut those final bar at the very last segment of our. So they'll be cut the morning of the shot. you're gonna have a trunk line and this is our trunk line here. So what we're doing is we're taking each of the detonators and we're clipping them into our trunk line. And then what we'll do probably tomorrow is go through and based upon our timing chart, scan the debts and program the debts. I am Roberto Folchi, owner of Nitrex, a company that specializes in the use of explosives for bridge demolition, control blasting for open pit and underground and underwater. While most of our jobs are in Italy, we have worked also in Africa, Asia and America in tunneling projects, dam construction, underwater and, and mining. Traveling is not an issue for us. I got my start in the business in 1982 as a technician trainee in an explosives engineering consulting firm in Rome. This was two years before I got graduated in, at the University of Rome in mining engineering. One year after graduation, I, went, I served in the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, from which I took leave as a second lieutenant. During the military service, I also got my license in engineering and license in geology. After the military service, I worked as a freelance engineer, consulting general contractor firms and mining firms for controlled use of, of explosives for demolition and mining projects, tunneling, bench blasting, uh, ground vibration monitoring, and all related activities. I also worked for uh, energetic materials factories 
uh, assessing risk and computing probability of occurrence and uh, extension of iso damage area for major accidents. In the year 2000, I founded Nitrex as a demolition and control blasting firm, contractor, because I wanted to work with my own equipment and uh, specialized equipment and uh, specialized and well-trained personnel. What was happening during the time that uh, construction company and also mining company um, face a decay in technical competences, which is continuing still now. Uh, and uh, they could give me less and less specialized person for my for the job. So I was obliged to do the job turnkey with my people and equipment. I never consider hours to be a real job, properly said, uh, more a hobby. Since day one, I felt so much involved in it that it was never a problem for me to work many hours a day, to study until late hours, to work on site under hot sun, under the rain, strong wind, freezing snow, uh, day, nights, sometimes days and nights. In my almost 40 years of activity, I faced so many different work contexts and challenging projects, uh, such that time in which I worked in, um, for a demolition project in a nuclear power plant, or that time where the, I had to make the excavation underwater up to a depth of 100 meters, about 300 feet, developing, designing and building fit for the purpose shape charges and the deployment system or when working in hydroelectric plants blasting very close to the turbines while they were spinning and so many other projects. This is Bergamo city center with uh, its old buildings since the middle age to modern times a very challenging neighborhood for blasting operations. This is Ripafrata Bridge to be demolished quick and tidy in order to do not interrupt too long traffic train below and also to do not damage a bridge ahead, another bridge before, 
Also, those two not in good shape. Uh, two carriageway road viaducts gone out of service due to overpassing uh, its life cycle, as so many other bridges in Green Force country built before year 1980, which are ready to be blasted, spans and pylons together in a reverse domino. Positano, Amalfi Coast in southern Italy, an iconic touristic place Many historical buildings, some of them from year 1600 and in bad shape, needed not to be stressed too much. And the occupants also, and especially, better to put in place several ground vibration and noise monitoring stations. Tearing down a bridge superstructure, it is possible and most convenient also in case its own pylons are to be kept safe, and also if another bridge is standing close by. This is an old twin arch bridge to be demolished one after the other, the second one eight months later to keep traffic on carriageway going on in both directions while completing the construction of the new bridge in the same place of the old one being demolished. The Pecorone bridge, another bridge took down with a reverse domino. Rovigo water tower, 82 meters high, tilted with explosives. The Kabbalah bridge, another one to be demolished with explosives. You're asking me what's the most difficult job I have ever done. The next one is until it is done and then again the next. This is what makes our work wonderful. Fueling your heart with extraordinary emotion and keeping your mind focusing on what it does really matters. And uh, come up through the ranks. Uh, you got to be willing to get dirty, get your hands involved, your feet into it, uh, put your heart and soul into it. Then you'll find your direction. Certainly, people are important, but from a structural standpoint, you look at how the building is being prepared. So, in developing your your demolition plan. How you prepare the building allows, allows it to be left in a stable position so when you're working in there and doing your thing, you're not going to cause a problem. So you manage that sort of the risk and the preparation in, in developing your plan and, and in, preparing, in preparing the structure. And then you manage risk by preparing and protecting the surrounding structures depending on your, uh, your exposure. If you're in a downtown environment, you've got a group of buildings across the street, you better board up the windows and cover them all up and do all that. And then you manage risk by pre-blast surveying and seismic monitoring. That's absolutely key to uh, any kind of a blast. You get some basic blasting experience, learning explosives, learning bird and spacing relationship, powder factors, learning what to do and what it takes. My favorite projects are my last project. Every single project that we've done, that I've done, that we've done as a team together in other places and other countries and other parts of the world, the last one is always the best one. And I say that because it was successful in more ways, whether it functioned the way we wanted it to or not. It was successful in the fact that we had a chance to bond together as a team 
uh, that we share our knowledge and our lessons learned and we're able to live another day. Drones, clear. Copy all clear. Here we go. Four, four, three, two, one. <laughs> it's a long five seconds, isn't it? <laughs> what do you think there, Clark? Well, I think the presenters did a great job on showing how technical our industry can be. Our question and answer session with moderator Travis Davis Saver, ISE board member and Emerging Professional Section Chairperson begins now. So take it away, Travis. Well, thanks again, Alistair. We really appreciate our sponsors and without them, we certainly would not have been able to bring this 10 part five night uh, free webinar series to you. Now let's talk live with our panelists, uh, Jim and Steve in Texas, Ron in Melbourne, Australia, Roberto in Northern Italy, and uh, they're all ready and excited to answer your questions about how they use explosives in the practice of demolition. And if you've got any questions, please send them in via the question and answer box. Let us know where you're from. And uh, as you ask your question, if you have, uh, want to direct it to one of our panelists, just let us know who, and we'll make sure that it gets to them. So our first question this evening, uh, let me pull up my questions here. Our first question this evening is for uh, Ron, and it comes from Bill in Illinois. Uh, Bill's asking Ron, why do you use the spray foam um, in the holes, the drill holes, uh, to protect the powder? Well, Bill, we use NG Dynamite, and the spray foam gives us a tad bit of security. Uh, it does a little bit of weatherproofing, and it gives us a check and balance to make sure the charges haven't been tampered with. Doesn't do a darn thing for stemming, but we're not using it for that. So Roberto, are you using a, a similar process in Italy to secure the boreholes? Yes, yes, we do. Secure the boreholes, 
uh, also one of the reason why we use foam is to prevent uh, in sequential blasting that charges are uh, sucked out from the hole for the uh, pressure of air of the previous explosion. So uh, guarantee you charge remains in the hole and are not taken out uh, in a sequential explosion. All right, thanks Roberto. Um, our next question is for all of our panelists and it comes from Scott. Uh, Scott's asking what is a good alternative explosive to NG dynamite for demolition blasting? And I'll start with Jim. Say hey, the question again, I didn't, I didn't hear. Uh, Scott's asking what a good alternative explosive to NG dynamite might be for demolition blasting. Well, NG dynamite is, is, will always be the best. There are the slurries and the emulsions, but they're, the, while they work, they're not as effective as the NG product. How about you, Ron? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, God, let us have dynamite. We're going to use NG dynamite wherever we can, boys and girls. Uh, it is very unforgiving, and it does exactly what we want it to do. Now, R Roberto, do you have uh, easy access to NG dynamite for demolition purposes in Italy? Yes, yes. We uh, Also for us, NG dynamites are the best choice. Uh, you can cut the cartridge in pieces, and sometimes we use 30 grams uh, or even less charges, which you that you cannot have with uh, uh, slurry or with uh, emulsion explosive. So uh, have a small smaller size than the cartridge itself. We use also, especially when we need to have seven grams, very low quantity of explosive as an alternative to NG dynamites. We use detonating cord, uh, which uh, are very reliable. Of course, we don't. Uh, like very much uh, emulsion because it's very they are very difficult to a very low sensitive so um, engine dynamites option number one detonating cord option number two all right thanks roberto our next question is another question for ron and it comes from vic in canada uh, vic says it looks like you have a lot of fun at work what do you do to keep that attitude in such a high consequence setting, such a high consequence setting, such as explosive demolition? Because I know why I'm here. Uh, I, I got put here. The Lord gave me a talent and a skill and I'm using it. And, and I love being around people working with various contractors and, and uh, suppliers. Couldn't ask for better. I'm down here in Australia now working with a fantastic team because brother Jim's allowed me to be, and we're going to make the most of it. We love this work. I love the pressure. If it wasn't for the pressure, I'd be doing something else. I love it. So Ron, uh, let's see, uh, Jim and, and Steve, how do you harness that energy and excitement uh, from Ron on every job site? I'll let you answer that one, Steve. <laughs> we just keep it going straight in the correct direction. We always move forward, don't we, Ron? We're a team. Love it. Love you guys. All of you. Look, the, the industry's absolutely best ever. Couldn't be in a better spot. Uh, so our next question is for Roberto, and it comes from Tony in Montana. Uh, Roberto, how hard is it for you to perform blasting across so many different countries? Well, it's not hard at all. It's uh, what makes this work nice. Uh, you change environment. You leave environment. What you normally see on television, you get from direct feeling, you can get the smell, uh, you know, different people uh, regarding the job itself. Um, I mean, it's um, when you work, you do not even consider to be in one single part of the world. You are concentrating on the project. Um, and uh, so um, really what it really matters is the project itself, but traveling, it's really a very nice, part of our world, changing culture, cuisine, and seeing different mentality, culture. It's really a, a very good part of our, what makes our work exceptional, very, very beautiful. All right, thanks Roberto. Um, our next question is coming from Jack, and Jack is asking all of our panelists, um, what are the white protective coverings around some of the blast areas? Are they identifiers or weather protection? And let's start with uh, Roberto on that question. Well, um, I guess that uh, it, um, 
the reference is made to tissue, which is normally placed to reduce the, 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 the dust. Uh, I mean, at least to try to reduce the dust. Um, you have several kind of cover to prevent fly rock, which is the biggest problem, biggest issue with uh, blasting. Uh, but uh, you normally use heavier mass, blasting mass, better, the best or, of all are the, um, the Marcella blasting mats. They are made in America. They are made with uh, uh, um, steel ropes, uh, venting, so they allow the gases from explosion to blow out and, and, uh, and keep all the fragments in it. The white is tissue to, to, to stop the, a little bit of dust. Uh, what you are really worried is uh, fragments, fragments or fragmentation fly rock. And for that you use blasting mats. All right, so Ron, I know when I was uh, on site with you for those three towers, you had all of the explosives encased in that, in that uh, wooden box that was wrapped in uh, a Tyvek fabric. Uh, do you want to uh, give us a little more detail on what that does for those shape charges on metal? Well, the shape charges are inherently frag, heavy frag producing. Uh, the shape charges that we use are manufactured by Accurate Energetics. Uh, they do a phenomenal job of severing the steel. They do a marvelous job of generating fragmentation. That said, uh, to mitigate the frag from damaging adjacent charges. Uh, we put the wooden boxes in the protective covering. You saw the white. There's different colors of material, different manufacturers. Uh, there's a lot of good tools out there on the market that we're still searching and trying now. Uh, Roland Alfred is doing a marvelous job down here of testing some new material. Uh, we'll find out about that at the end of the month. And so we're constantly looking as a team to mitigate the amount of fly, the fragmentation. So those boxes, that material is in the uh, event to, to mitigate that fragmentation. We don't like frag. You saw it in the video. Can't stand it. I would, I would say that there's a, the, the fragmentation poses more than one threat uh, once those materials start flying off site. Roger uh, that. We want, we want to be home safe. We want everybody home safe. And that little bit of protection gets us there. Certainly. Our next question is uh, for Jim, and it comes from Vladimir, who's in Europe. Uh, Vladimir um, has indicated that, you know, you're using uh, many kinds of explosives in your work. Are they custom built for what you do? The, there's, only, there's only one manufacturer for linear shape charges in America for cutting, for cutting steel, which is Accurate Energies. And again, it's my NG Dynamite is our first choice is everybody would say. Um, so those are the two work tools that we use primarily as, as well as Primacord. We love to use Primacord as well, but most of that stuff is right off the shelf from different suppliers. So it's not particularly customized for our work. So Jim, how do you decide which uh, shape charges to use on a specific project? The, the thickness of the steel determines the size of the shape charge you're gonna use unless it's a special heavy dense steel like a T1 or something, and then you have to increase the size of the shape charge. The shape charges are made in various sizes for cutting certain, certain thicknesses. All right, thanks, Jim. Our next question uh, is from Roberto and it comes from Jerry Wallace, who's in Washington. Uh, Jerry would, uh, says, uh, he knows you've taken down a lot of bridges. What's the total number of bridges you've now successfully taken down, Roberto? Uh, 113 until now, 113 bridges, which uh, I cannot tell you exactly the number of spans, but it exceeds the 800, 800 spans in total and more than uh, 600 pilots. Normally, uh, or maybe frequently, you only demolish spans and the pilots are kept for the new superstructure. Uh, the, the bridge we demolish are reinforced concrete. The new superstructure is normally made of steel, so it's lighter. And so the old pilots can be used, uh, properly used 
for giving to the bridge another 200 years of uh, life cycle of life. So the awful lot of bridges that have met their demise uh, with your expertise, Roberto. Now, Jim, how about you? How many structures have you taken down in your career? Oh, several thousand. I lost count, and I don't even know how many bands. Of bridges. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the next question we've got here is uh, for. We'll start with Ron, and it comes from Bill in Nevada. Uh, Bill is wondering, Ron, if you practice before you take down a new structure. Well, mom always said you practice in the backyard before you ever go public. The problem with doing that nowadays is, is that not many kids can go in the backyard and practice what we do without going to jail. So when it comes to practice, if we have an opportunity to do a test shot, obviously we'll try to do a test shot. But as you saw me tell PJ in the video, typically we're out there at one shot, one kill and we don't have an opportunity to do very many test shots. It's nice to have a location when we can, we will, but we don't necessarily always have to do it. And that's what really puts the pressure on all of us to get it done right the first time. Now, Roberto, do you, do you end up uh, with an opportunity to practice before you take down some of these structures? It may happen that in large projects, we make tests, uh, but not related to the project itself. So once we have a chance, we have beams or, or concrete structure that uh, we can use for testing uh, purpose, then we have this opportunity. But also for us, uh, the, the, the difficulty in our job is that you can not, uh, you have only one sh chance to do it. Uh, practice is possible, but not for the job you are doing. So sometimes we do, but it's not, the, uh, is not the rule. It, it's pretty clear to me that experience is the, the main ingredient in success here. This is not something that uh, you just go into lightly. Yeah. All right. Uh, Scott has got another question for all of you in the group, and I'll start with Jim here. Uh, Jim, have you ever turned down a large demolition job because explosive demolition was not a good option? Yes, yeah, several. Lots, lots of times you turn it down because there's no room to really do it with the word. To, to put it or the structure doesn't lend itself to uh, explosive demolition. So in those cases, Jim, what, uh, what do you do? What do they do next? If explosives aren't Take there? Take it down either a floor at a time or a high reach excavator or crane and ball, you know, they're all, they're all different based on the circumstances, you know, in downtown New York city, they take them down a floor at a time, push all the debris down the, down the elevator shafts or crane it down. So, Every job is totally different depending on its circumstances and the room around it. How about you, Roberto? Have you uh, ever turned on a job because demolition using explosives wasn't the right tool? Yes, it happens frequently. Uh, it happens frequently. Explosives are convenient for high structure. Normally we are requested to do a job with explosive also for low structure. I remember once that I tried to convince the customer not to use explosive because the structure was really very, uh, was, was very short, but they want to make a show. There was a, in Imola, in the racing, Formula One racing circuit. So the, I tried to convince them not to use explosive. They didn't believe me. And so they had the show, but uh, the alternative for explosive is mechanical demolition and, uh, uh, but we are, I guess that a demolition contractor must be prepared to do both, explosive when possible and mechanical demolition. In fact, we also, especially when you work in, 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 in very uh, in, in difficult neighborhoods, we, we also do mechanical demolition as an alternative to explosives. All right, thanks Roberto. Our next question is for Ron and it comes from Amanda who is one of our previous presenters. Uh, Amanda is asking, um, are demolition explosives and the materials you work with less sensitive than fireworks and pyrotechnics? Absolutely not. Amanda, I love you. Thank you for the question. Uh, respect to different formulations, flash powder is by far the most sensitive. Armstrong mix, as you well know, is the most dangerous. Uh, in, the de in the explosives world, uh, the manufacturers, uh, have the materials so that we can do a number of wonderful things with them. But in reality, 
It's all up to you, the end user, as to what you do with it and how you use it. They all will kill you. And it's very, very important that we express training, training, training before you ever put your hands on any of this material because it will bite you and it don't care who you are. Copy that. Loud and clear, loud and clear, Ron. Um, our next question uh, is for Jim and it comes from Ricky in Brazil. How do you tackle being the first at taking down some of these structures? Well, experience always helps you uh, applying some of the principles that you've learned and done before. And, you know, a lot of study and a lot of forethought of uh, the principles that you've learned on previous structures will apply it to something new and different. Uh, gravity still works, explosives still work. And so you try and apply those principles and create a failure in the structure uh, to allow it to collapse in the mechanism that you planned and on. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, our next question here is uh, coming from, it's for Roberto and it's coming from Blair in Canada. And Blair would like to know how you do underwater blasting with charges that sit above the rock and move the rock without drilling. Shape charges, um, when the rock to be excavated is very deep, so it's difficult to drill a hole in it. And, and, and more than drill a hole to load the hole after it's drilled, um, you use shape charges, which are sort of granite. Uh, shape charges are uh, projecting a piece of metal. Uh, the one we use are, is aluminum because it's, uh, but can be also copper. This projectile thrown at a very high speed towards the rock creates a crater. The explosion gases enter this crater, enlarge the cracks, and the charge one above, uh, close to the other, cracks are connected, and so the rock is, is uh, broken. Uh, the quantity of explosive is normally higher, five to 10 times higher than the one you would need in, uh, if blasting the rock with explosive into the hole, but you have, um, because you have no chance to use the, the, to, to drill the hole, that's the only alternative. This allow you to do underwater excavation quickly and especially at the very high depth. As, uh, we did a very interesting project in the US in Lake Mead and we excavated from 80 meters to 100 meters without drilling a single hole. 20 meters of rock excavation without drilling a hole. Exactly, one layer after the other took a while, was about uh, 50,000 cubic meters, to more than one year. Uh, and, uh, but definitely that was the only possible way to excavate, to dig a hole at that depth. Wow, that's an exciting project and uh, in a really interesting use of new technology. Um, our next question is for Jim and it comes from Lawrence, who's in Alberta. Jim, what advice do you have for someone wanting to get a job in the explosives demolition field? Well, I'd like to hire people that have some previous explosive experience um, so they have a basic knowledge of it and then try and find somebody, as Ron would say, with fire in the belly that wants to really do it and has a desire to learn it. But there's a small marketplace, so it's not like you, you can you need a whole lot of people to continue to do this. But uh, again, you'd want somebody with some previous uh, experience with explosives and a fire in the belly and somebody that maybe has some engineering experience that uh, really wants to do and learn this process. All right, we have about three minutes left here. And our next question is for all, all of you. And it comes from Glenn, who's in New South Wales. <clears throat> Glenn wants to know what has been your most challenging project? And I'll start with you, Ron. The most challenging, uh, that view the most challenging is being one of the most uh, impressionable shots I've ever been on. I'll make it quick. I was invited in 1995 to do the 50th anniversary of the end of the war and had Paul Tibbetts and his crew and Gene Krantz of the Apollo 13 mission. And we set off a mushroom cloud, I'll leave it at that. And that to this day remains one of the most impressionable 
most God awful things I've ever done in my life. And with this, I've got to say, Travis, we've got to continue this dialogue after this is over with. This has got to continue. We can't cram 70 years of experience in three minutes. So please continue this. Find those with a fire in the belly. Get in the get involved in our industry. Come see us. Thank you. Certainly. How about you, Roberto? What's been your most challenging and exciting project? Challenging, uh, definitely this in of the underwater excavation because we had to invent uh, and produce and test uh, a shape charge for the purpose, which was not uh, results were not given uh, because we had no previous experience. We had nothing to refer to. Uh, nobody else had done an excavation at that depth before. And uh, this was in, in involving several aspects of our, of the explosive sector, which was that of uh, the physical of shape charges. So the physical of, of explosives. Fortunately, uh, we are a few people in, in, in uh, taking care of explosive business. We know each other, we help each other. I had a very good help for, to design the charge from France and Sweden research institutes. <clears throat> uh, and uh, definitely this is an uh, underwater, this deep water underwater excavation was um, one of the most challenging, but really uh, because of the risk involved, because of the, you know, the, of, the, of the fact that you have no second chance, I would tell you that challenging is from the big to the small one, all of them. The, once you have done it, once the structure is on the ground, you calm down. But before that moment, uh, and especially after having fired the bottom, uh, time stops. And, uh, and so every single job is challenging. And Jim, I'll let you have the final word here with what you uh, found to be your most exciting and challenging projects. One of them was Texas Stadium, uh, where the Cowboys won some Super Bowls and two of the, the rocket towers at Cape Canaveral. What, what made those so exciting and, and unique and challenging, Jim? Well, they were unusual type of structures. While they were steel structures, they were built differently than a standard building. And the, it was just the first time ever done at Cape Canaveral and uh, unusual steel sizes and configurations. So that always makes it challenging. And Texas Stadium was a, was a rare type of structure with an unusual roof and unusual abutments. So that was fun and challenging as well. Well, I really want to appreciate all of you online. We had at least 30 questions that we didn't get to for our panelists. So I know there's a lot of excitement and interest um, about the use of explosives and demolition. I really want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, if you're in the Americas, uh, this morning, if you're in uh, Europe, and uh, this afternoon, if you're in Australia, wherever you are, thanks for joining. I really want to thank our panelists for a great discussion, and a special thanks to Roberto, Jim, and Ron for an amazing and entertaining look at how explosives are used in demolition. Um, what a great segment, and we really appreciate you being a part of this. Uh, this wraps up the question and answer session for the series. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all back at another ISE-sponsored event, whether that's virtual or hopefully in person soon. Uh, become a member of the ISC and stay on top of the interesting things we do as explosives engineers and as blasters. So thanks, Travis, and thank you for watching this episode of the ISE Explosives Everyday Series. Explosives are the ultimate power tool that help mine the minerals and materials that are used in creating many of the products and roadways we use each and every day. They help keep our towns and cities safe from avalanches. They are used to shape and improve the environment and also military and demolition applications. And they're in some of our favorite TV shows, movies, sporting events, and concerts. Our job as professionals in the explosive industry and at the ISEE is to ensure explosives continue to be handled and applied in the safest way possible, and to continue to provide the resources and tools needed to help advance the science and art of explosive engineering. If you're interested in finding out more about the International Society of Explosive Engineers, please go to our website, ISEE.org. You'll find information about membership, our chapters around the world, and other useful links, including a calendar of upcoming events, as well as conferences and meetings in our industry. Another great resource is the World of Explosives, where you can find information on using explosives safely, the most frequently asked questions from homeowners about blasting, how blast vibrations affect structures, 
and all the planning that goes into each blast. It's also home to Explosives the Power Tool. This is a video series covering the history of explosives and the technical advancements that have been made possible because of them. To check it out, visit explosives.org. So a special thank you to this episode's sponsors, LDE Global, Dynana Bell, Opit Blast, Sigicom, and Accurate Energetic Systems. Before we go, here's a short video from Dynana Bell. Detit is proud to introduce the Differential Global Positioning Tagger as a new feature to the already market-leading DigiShot Plus 4G system. The process of tagging and hole identification is now made simpler with the Differential GPS sub 1 meter hole accuracy. This unique addition to the DigiShot Plus 4G system takes away any possibility of human error during the tagging process, making mining simpler, safer and smarter. You have to be very quiet and gentle. You are building a new subway and you don't want anyone to notice. It's a surprise. That's why you have monitors that pick up on everything. You monitor and measure vibration, air blast, noise, dust. Nothing escapes you. You can be halfway around the world and you still would notice every minor change here, right when it happens. People nearby don't notice anything, but you do. You make adjustments, so even less will be noticed in the next blast. What was that? A plane flying overhead. Small children playing. They're having fun. You blow up more of the rock, deep below the playground. Gently, quietly. It's a surprise after all. People appreciate you most when they can't see, hear, or feel you. The monitors show nothing. And that is everything. Infra, remote monitoring of construction sites. From Sigicom. So that's it for this episode of Explosives Every Day. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn pages to stay up to date with all the latest ISE happenings. Be sure to check out all 10 of our episodes highlighting the different ways explosives are used around the world every day. On behalf of the ISEE, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.